Hello and welcome to my July 2018 Patreon Q&A video where my Patreon supporters have uh, put forward a few questions for me to answer in this video and I'm going to get right into it and uh, hopefully now I can get the August one done fairly soon and I'll be kind of caught up again so it won't be completely delayed. Fingers crossed. So the first one I got here was from Chris, CM42TV uh, or The Good Bit Podcast, cheap plug. Uh, he said, I'd quite like to hear your thoughts on one of our last podcast topics. Why do we still go to the cinema? Do you prefer that experience, or do you rather just watch uh, a film at home on Blu-ray with all the special features and audio commentaries? Why do we still go to the cinema? Um, it's an experience. It's uh, it's an act of actually going out and doing something. It's, uh, you know, you've you got to go out and get on that bus. You've got to go out and get in your car. You know, you got to you know walk down the street if you live near one. You know, you got to pick up your ticket. You got to go in. You got to sit down. Uh, you know, you've made an effort to be there, and so I think you pay more attention to it. But also, you're in this room with other people, so you can't just pause the film and get your phone out and look on Facebook or whatever. You know, you have to sit down and watch the film. And you know, a lot of people don't do that still. But you know, the the theory is that you sat in that seat, you paid your money, you got to watch the film. Uh, th th there's something about it. I mean, it's not just because it's a big screen, it's because it's a, it's a communal experience as well. There's something special sometimes. If you're lucky, if you get to go to a cinema where everyone in that room is there to watch and enjoy the film and to get something out of it, uh, you can. And the film is great, you know, or special. It can it can make for some incredible moments. You know, I think I'll always be living off, um, you know, the high of some of those great cinema experiences, which I believe is Chris's second question. But I love watching films at home. I love the, the conveniency of that. As far as special features and audio commentaries, you know, I, I love special features. Ever since the early days of DVD, I was just in love with special features, audio commentaries. Couldn't get enough of them. Would go to bed every single night with audio commentaries on and watching these special features, devouring them. I just don't have the time anymore. You know, I, I really try to watch them when I can, but uh, they often don't get watched because there's, there's always the next movie or, or whatever. But, you know... It, I love watching films at home because I can kind of be in control of the situation for the most part. But going to a cinema and also having the superior quality of the visuals and the sound is, is a big plus. But you, there is always a gamble as well as far as, right, what are we going to get in that room today? You know, is it going to be distracting? Uh, there's that too. So th there's pros and cons, but I think it, it's always going to be there. It's never going to die out because it's just... There's something special about it, you know, and, and going out on a Friday night or whatever or, you know, making a day of it and going to the cinema is something that I really cherish and enjoy. And me and Connie love doing it together and uh, we'll continue to do it for as long as we're around and cinemas are around. You know, it's just it's uh, and again, I think a big part of it is the fact you do have to sit there and watch the film and you can't just like pause it and, you know, maybe your mind wanders or God forbid you actually start looking on your phone while the film's still running which again, some people still do in the cinema. I believe that Chris's second question was, uh, what was your best and worst cinema experience? Uh, people talking through a quiet place, probably. Yeah, uh, and, and I, could, I could go into that whole, why do we go to the cinema topic for like a full hour if I wanted to, but I'm just kind of very briefly skating over it uh, to get to the other questions. Best and worst cinema experiences. There's been some real shit ones recently, I, I, I have to say, a quiet place, probably does get pretty high up there because it's a film that was marketed uh, well it's not even marketed the title is called A Quiet Place and people are rusting around with their crush chewing their popcorn with their mouths open um, looking on their phone giggling, laughing at all the, the tense moments and uh, you know just chatting amongst themselves and it was just intolerable and I can't wait to see that film probably with headphones on just so I can fully immerse myself in that movie because it's all about the silence and it's just impossible to achieve. I mean, I saw it for a second time and thought, come on, let's get a good screening. And it's, again, this woman comes in on the front row. She's got this tray of fucking nachos chowing down for a good 45 minutes. She's got this big slurpee. She's like, <laughs> you know, and then the, the, the tap in the cup and then she pulls off the top and it's like, you know, and it's like, what are you doing? You know, and I eat, I eat in the cinema. You know, I have snacks and I all, like I'm the guy who's there for like, you know, four minutes with his hand like that. 
waiting for like a loud part of the film just to put my hand inside a bag of crisps while I'm trying not to touch the edges, you know. I'm so conscious of it, I don't want to disturb anyone. But it, just, it blows my mind how easy people can just, just dig in and just make all this noise, even in quiet emotional parts of a film. I think Black Panther in 4DX, there was a, the whole row behind us were just talking throughout the entire film. Why are you spending the money to do what you can do outside? Just just fuck off outside and, and chat and laugh and, and be just obnoxious pricks on your own time uh, outside somewhere or in your house even. Just go sit in your living room, right? And just, just put any film on. It doesn't matter what the film is. You're just talking anyway, right? To get me started. Best cinema experiences. Uh, Shaun of the Dead. Always go back to that. Only about 150 people in the room is kind of like half half kind of occupied. Everyone there was a fan of space. Everyone there was so excited for this film and it was an absolute riot. I just, that was so cool. Um, we'll, we'll always remember that. Uh, going to see episode two, uh, Star Wars Attack of the Clones on uh, the opening weekend and it was packed and I, I felt this thing I've never felt in the cinema before. And it was, you know, say, say what you want about the film that physical feeling that I got from the whole room was just uh, amazing. Uh, I've talked about it before and I'll probably go into it in a bit more detail in the future. But uh, I would say my favorite cinema experience ever is probably the third viewing of The Last Jedi. It was the Friday night. I'd already seen it twice, obviously, because it's the third viewing. Um, <laughs> and it was the Friday night. It was packed. Connie hadn't seen it. I was so excited for her to see it. Hearing her gasp next to me, you know, hearing her, feeling her getting involved and kind of getting excited by the film. But just the whole atmosphere was electric and I'll never forget, I will never forget the moment when Kylo snaps that lightsaber on, cuts Snoke in half, Ray grabs the lightsaber, Kylo ignites his, they turn back to back. And the whole room, right, didn't explode, didn't start cheering. But there was this feeling of, holy shit, the excitement. I heard someone kind of making a ruckus behind me. There was so much excitement in that room. And, and this was Norway, you know, in like December. And at the end of the, the, the screening, we were just boiling because the energy of everyone in that room, the blood was pumping, I guess. It was just, it was awesome. I'll never forget that. It was just incredible. Uh, and I would say that <laughs> some of my other best cinema experiences were like the first and sixth viewing of The Last Jedi as well, because I cried both times. Anyway, <laughs> outside of that, there, there's so many more. Uh, seeing Dawn for the Planet of the Apes, actually, which was a bit of a weird one because there were some real dickheads in the in the room who were mouthing off to Connie or something, and that was really uncomfortable. But uh, it was special because the, the subtitles were in Norwegian, so... Whenever the apes were speaking, I had no clue what was going on. So Connie was kind of leaning over and kind of just whispering to me what they were saying. Uh, and there was just something about the way she was translating it that just kind of enhanced the movie. Just because, you know, I'm so in love with her. And, and kind of having her be a part of it as far as the narrating the apes was kind of just a real sweet kind of thing that uh, made it so unique and something that will never happen again, really. Unless I force her to to do it, which I won't, because that's just weird. Um, and I think we talked about that in one of the, the movie marathons where we, where we watched the film. So I always go back to that as a weird one, but one that uh, I, I really enjoyed. Anyway, I could talk about great and bad cinema experiences all day long as well. So thank you, Chris, for the questions. Now I need to go and find uh, the rest of them elsewhere on my notes. And then we'll continue on with this thing. So... We have Graham over at Man vs. Film. Uh, what's the one DVD slash Blu-ray slash VHS slash 4K movie package that you'd love to own but don't? I would say that uh, the, the white whale for me that I, I never will get is the AK-100 uh, Criterion DVD box set. Uh, ooh, th that's just an incredible piece. That's, I think, 25 films. Uh, almost the entirety of Akira Kurosawa's filmography uh, goes from the beginning, I think, to the end. I think they have Madadayo at the very end, and the beginning would be Sanshiro Sugato Part 1. So, uh, incredible set, uh, nice book, you know, just, and it was to celebrate the 100th, uh, I guess, anniversary of his birth, I think it was. Yeah, it must be. 
So you know, very deluxe set. Uh, my friend Robbie Webster has it when we visited him in New York. That was the one of the first set. Like, Can I see the, the AK-100 set? And I just was just looking through it and stuff, looking at the covers. It's a fantastic box set. I would love to have that, but it's, I mean, you're talking thousands of pounds. Never going to happen. Would never spend that money on it anyway. And besides, ugh, the DVD. <laughs> but just as a, you know, it's something I've always really wanted, I think. And yeah, there's not really anything Blu-ray wise that I'm like, oh, I wish I could have that. You know, I mean, there's there's little things here and there, like maybe out of print stuff, like the Chunking Express Criterion Blu-ray. Apart from that, there's, there's nothing really um, huge. I would say that AK100 set is the one. Um, so thank you for the question. Uh, Justin Peterson asks, do you like any films from Lars von Trier? I know a lot of his work aims to make viewers uncomfortable, but I found his films Breaking the Waves, Dancer in the Dark, and Dogville to be extremely powerful and moving. Uh, there's no point to put the phone down here because I don't really have an answer. I haven't seen any of Lars von Trier's films. I'm very aware of, of his filmography and the controversy surrounding many of his films. So yeah, I haven't seen any of those films or any of his films in general. I know there are a few in the book that I need to review, so you know I'll get to that eventually, I suppose. Didn't he do Melancholia as well? I, I'm quite intrigued to see that one. He also asks, what do you make of this cliche people say about films lately? No one asked for this in regards to movies like Solo and Jurassic Park or Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Personally, I would love to know who this board of people are who are requesting movies. This cliche just drives me nuts since in this new age of social media, people feel so entitled to trash on things just for fun. Yeah, I agree with that. You know, it's very popular to kind of just trash stuff. And when you do trash stuff, you get more likes and retweets and things like that. But yeah, uh, no one asked for this movie. No one asked for Solo, you know, that kind of thing. Um... I don't know. I mean, I, I, I see the logic in it, to be honest with you. When the solo film was first announced, I was like, I don't want that. You know, I'm like, why are they doing that? You know, and then I saw it and I loved it. You know, it's no masterpiece, but it was a very enjoyable film. But yeah, when, you, when you're like, no one asked for this and you start getting your pitchforks out, it's just, it's just a waste of time. You know, it's just, it's a waste of time to engage with it as well. But I, I, you know, I'm guilty as anyone of getting involved and saying, well, hang on a minute, you know, and I try and jump in for defense but you know those people are like terminators they can't be they can't be reasoned with they can't be bargained with you know they're just going to be outraged that's what they do that's all they do <laughs> they can't be stopped have you seen terence malick's film the thin red line before no i haven't uh, i hated it when i saw it as a teen since i was expecting my war films to be like saving private ryan or full metal jacket Instead, I think it depicts war from a much more visceral, humanistic level I was so taken by when I rewatched it. Again, I'm sorry, I haven't seen the film. But, uh, you know, as far as war movies go, I, I always love war films that don't really deal with the, the actual war. You know, things that kind of uh, deal with the periphery of it, like, uh, like Grave of the Fireflies. You know, you look at these two kids who have been very directly and uh, hugely impacted by the war. Uh, or, you know, you look at maybe The Human Condition, which has maybe 10, 15 minutes of actual kind of war battle scenes in it. And then it's like another nine hours of kind of just the, you know, the, the reality of being in prison of war camps and being on the run and, and you know, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I, 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 I like war films that deal more with the human element than even though big war battle scenes, there is a human element there. But, you know, that there is this kind of... Uh, you know, uh, kind of showing off the, the, the scope and scale of everything. I think that um, Paths of Glory is one of the best ones. That kind of trench scene is just, like, that moved me to tears. It was so powerful. It felt like a real war. So, it, it you know, it, it can be very effective, but I do like war films that deal more on the, the effects of war than the actual war itself. There's merits to both, don't get me wrong. Thank you for the questions. Uh, Aaron Pennington asks... And we have some background noise. I'm just going to power through it. What is your favorite movie monster? That's a really good one. Um, movie monster. I mean, there's King Kong. My mind instantly jumps to that. I think the original King Kong is just such a classic film and uh, such a great character. But I have movie monster. You know, I love the rancor in Return of the Jedi. But I think my favorite movie monster. You could go to Godzilla as well. But I'm, I'm really 
not well versed in Godzilla at all. I've seen you know the original Godzilla, of course, the classic, and then uh, uh, Shin Godzilla and uh, the two American ones. But th- there was one in my head, and it's gone. Frankenstein is one. Frankenstein's monster, I should say. I was so surprised by those films when I saw them. Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, two incredible films. And I think Boris Karloff is just just sublime in that role. Like he really just gives an incredible performance. Uh, it's what it's like. It's what it's like trying to film here. It's just it's unending. I just have to. I have no choice but to have this in videos, really. Okay, a lot of noise disturbance, so I don't even know where I, where I was with what I was talking about, but favorite movie monster would be the Xenomorph from the Alien franchise. Something so iconic about the look of that, it's just something so otherworldly that of course comes from the, the haunting design from uh, H.R. Giga, just f- out of this world, like it's just something from your absolute deepest, darkest nightmares, and it's been cheapened, no doubt, over the years with... CGI models of it, you know, when just the the bare glimpses of it, you know, that of that that big head in the the shadows and the smoke and the slime in that first Alien film, uh, and the way that it was so chillingly um, brought to it to more a more nimble life in Aliens, uh, James Cameron's film. Yeah, that's my favorite movie, Monster. You know, it doesn't have the the nuance of you know a, a monster that you follow and sympathize with, but as far as just this absolute kind of you know. Think something for me a nightmare. I think the Xenomorph would be my favorite movie monster. I'm such a fan of those films as well, but I think it's such a great design. Number two from Aaron Pennington. He says, "Is there a filmmaker who you feel gets an undeserved amount of hate? If so, who and why? A filmmaker who gets an undeserved amount of hate? If so, and why? Who and why? Yeah, Ryan Johnson." Why? Because he's a fucking great filmmaker. <laughs> you know, you look at this guy who made this this great film, Brick. You know, uh, and then made another film, Brothers Bloom, which I haven't seen. Made Looper, which everyone everyone loved Looper. You know, and, and who doesn't love Breaking Bad? And what did he direct? Some of the best episodes of Breaking Bad, including the best episode of Breaking Bad. Great director. Makes a Star Wars film. People don't like. Oh, he's a hack director. Ah. Oh. Such a boring director, you know. <clears throat> the 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 amount of hate level of that guy is, is so unreasonable and petty and uh, and childish and petulant and just just unearned, you know. Uh, so yeah, I'd say Ryan Johnson, uh, which is a boring answer, I guess, because I talked about this. I've talked about this many times, but uh, I can't actually think of anyone else, to be honest, who I think, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> who really gets um, that much hate. That doesn't deserve it, I suppose. I mean, there's some, but uh, you know, I, I can't say McGee, you know, really um, deserves a second look. You know? <laughs> or you know, there's there's some directors who they they just don't make very good films, and that's it. Uh, number three from Aaron Pennington. Also, is there a particular geeky property or franchise that you just can't get into for some reason? And I believe that's the last question. So. Um, you know, no doubt the fact that I've kind of been springing these Q and A's on people over and over and over again, um, or maybe I've missed some. I don't know. In which case, I'll roll them over for the August Q and A. But uh, yeah, hopefully we can kind of get back to a normal schedule where I can do a Q and A every month, and you'll all have a month to think of new questions. Anyway, what was the question? Shit, uh, I've completely forgotten. What a shithead I am. I'm so sorry. Um, no, it's not coming into... Okay, is there a particular geeky property or franchise that you just can't get into for some reason? Star Trek, absolutely. Number one. Number two, Doctor Who. Can't get into those for the life of me. And, uh, you know, I think anyone who, who considers themselves a fan of Doctor Who or a fan of Star Trek or a Trekkie, you know, they just, you know... Awful, you know, deserve to be shot, honestly. I, I have no idea where people like those things, and the very fact that they're fans of them actually gets me angry. Um, but the, the real reason that I don't really get into them is because I don't have the time. <laughs> I don't really have an opinion. And of course, that was I was kidding there, in case you didn't realize. Maybe my sarcasm wasn't clear, I don't know. 
it's been a long day of filming many videos and I'm getting quite tired at this point, but uh, you know, l love the fact that people love Doctor Who and love Star Trek, and you know it's great that you have this huge world to be a fan of because it, the 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 depth of those properties, those franchises, uh, is just incredibly deep. It just goes on forever. It seems like with Doctor Who, you've got hundreds of episodes, like countless dozens of series, and, and then there's books and audio dramas and all that kind of stuff. And Star Trek is even bigger. It's just the time. I don't have the time to sit down and fully invest. And that's the thing with me is I'm a completist. I don't want to... Okay, let's watch, like, the 2005 Doctor Who. No, I want to go back to episode one. <laughs> you know, I want to watch everything. I don't want to, like, start somewhere and be like, okay, this, this is the modern era and not know what came before. I know that it was kind of... You know, a huge span of time had passed when uh, Christopher Eccleston took up the role. But I don't know, maybe one day I will just look at the new stuff. I'm sure that's kind of, it's so split off that it kind of is its own thing. But even then, there's so much of it. I've seen bits and pieces. It's been kind of enjoyable, but I just never have looked into it. You know, my nan has appeared in a few episodes as a, a background extra. So I've, I've seen those those bits and pieces. But And Star Trek is the same. You know, there's just so much of it. But maybe Star Trek is a bit more manageable, at least, you know. Uh, one day I do actually want to try and at least watch the original series and Next Generation because my mum loved Star Trek uh, when I was a kid. She was always watching Next Generation, always watching Voyager, and, and especially Deep Space Nine I think was her favourite. It was between that and Voyager, and I, I really loved Voyager, actually I will say. Deep Space Nine, eh, not so much. Voyager... I actually really liked that one and, and watched many episodes, but never to a point where I, I got any sense of an overarching um, arc, you know, or, or, pl or plot line that was running through the whole show or anything. So just one of those things. So, and I know that there's the new one that's just started as well, Discovery, I think it's called. So, you know, and then there's, there's more to come. There's the new Picard thing that's happening. And I've seen a lot of the movies, actually, Star Trek, but it's been so long, I was so young. I, I never got into it to the, the point where I, I enjoyed something like Star Wars. It was a bit too technological and a bit too dry for me compared to the, the grandeur and myth and fantasy of Star Wars. But that was when I was a kid. As an adult now, I might really dig it and get into it, but it's just the time and just the, the wealth of episodes and, and series and things like that. But who knows, uh, one day it might happen. So that's been my Q&A for July 2018. Hope you enjoyed. Again, to all my, my Patreon supporters, thank you so much. I appreciate it every single month. And uh, feel free to contact me, whether it's uh, through Twitter, private messaging, or on my Facebook page, uh, facebook.com slash Ryan. Add me on there if you haven't already. Uh, or, or just, um, you know, again, keep posting the questions in the... Uh, the Patreon uh, Facebook group that we have. So uh, yeah, that's uh, that's about it. I, I I feel like I might have missed someone's question because there wasn't many, but I am kind of rolling these out towards you in a very un uh, unstructured manner. So I apologize for that. I really do. But again, uh, hopefully you enjoy these videos and everyone else does as well. And uh, I'll see you in the next one. Hey, all right by me. <laughs> Apart from the fact he throws cans of Carlin into a tree. <laughs> yeah, he's really cool. Yeah, he's really cool. But he's not quite as cool as you. Cause...